Hey everyone, this is Nick and welcome back to your weekly recap of the Linux and open source news. So this week we have Red Hat restricting access to the code source of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We have a big progress report on Plasma 6 and we have the first beta for Linux Mint 21.2, which despite its small number bump is actually a big, big release. So let's get started with all of this and with this segue to our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Tuxcare, the company that helps make your Linux server and workstation fleets more secure. And as you might know, Ubuntu 18.04 is now end of life, which means you're not going to get any security fixes or patches for the system or anything in its repos. And if you still run 18.04 on your servers or workstations, you will have to prepare a transition to a newer version which, as we all know, can be time-consuming and requires a bit of planning. In the meantime, Tuxcare can let you keep your 18.04 machines and make sure that you're still protected, thanks to their Extended Lifecycle Support, or ELS. With that, you get 5 more years of security patches for the system and a ton of packages, 24-7 support and live patching for the kernel to ensure you're safe without ever rebooting. So, if you want to keep your 18.04 devices for a bit longer while you plan your transition, click the link in the description below and get started with Tuxcare's ELS services. So, Red Hat is catching a lot of flack with their latest move. They have decided to make CentOS Stream the only repository that's publicly accessible for Red Hat Enterprise Linux-related source code. This means that the source code for RHEL is now only accessible to paid customers of Red Hat through their customer portal. This customer portal comes with terms and conditions that prevent you from redistributing the software or from using it to build another non-Red Hat product. And this will impact distros that aim to be one-to-one -one compatible with Red Hat like Alma Linux and Rocky Linux, although both of them put out statements saying that they were confident they could keep doing what they do by picking specific patches from the CentOS stream repos, but that it might make their work harder in the process if they want to ensure a fully perfect one-to-one -one binary compatibility. Of course, one might wonder why Red Hat is doing this, and the main theory here is that the rise of Alma Linux and Rocky Linux after they moved to the CentOS Stream model, took a bit out of Red Hat's paid business, and they are now trying to counter that by making it more difficult for these distros to operate. One could also point to IBM, the owner of Red Hat, forcing them to protect their paid revenue. I personally have no idea if any of this is true, it might just be a simple move to have less code repositories to manage, clean up, keep up to date, and where issues are logged and have to be addressed. I don't know. And this should not be illegal, because the GPL doesn't prevent you from locking your source code to your paid customers only. But this is definitely not in the spirit of open source. Red Hat is building their distribution on the back of countless completely available open source projects, and them locking that code behind what is virtually a paywall is generally not really well perceived. Now, there are a lot of things to talk about in the KDE world this week. First, with a progress report on Plasma 6. Currently, it compiles, it is what they call livable, as in you can use it, even though it's not entirely stable or bug-free, and some of the planned features and changes are already implemented, but not all of them. And also, there's a solid pass of testing and bug-fixing left to do, obviously. Now, the next steps are to merge some code with Kirigami, which is the more recent interface building framework for KDE apps. This will help deduplicate things and they can start using Kirigami everywhere and so they can have less bugs because with less code to look at, you're less likely to encounter big problems. Developers are also working on having more legible settings pages where the various configuration modules that are loaded in the main settings app can declare the components they need that are then drawn by the system settings app itself so some buttons will now move to the header of the settings page instead of having double stacks of buttons at the bottom. Another change is to SDDM, the login screen that KDE uses. It got a new release, the first in two and a half years, and the project is being brought under the KDE umbrella, and it will use KDE technologies. 
Other things include improved graphics performance when using hybrid graphics with a dedicated NVIDIA GPU, and there's some work going on to deliver what they call a massive performance improvement for Intel GPU users, although we'll have to wait for next week to know exactly what this entails. Cute scaling will also be used for X11 as well as in Wayland in Plasma 6, although that will not work on mixed DPI multi-monitor setups as X11 just doesn't support this use case at all. And in terms of UI changes and features, the Welcome Center will now cater to distributions and will let them add a special page to launch the distro's installer in a live environment. The web browser widget will also show its website's fav icon in the panel by default. Dolphin will let you open the partition manager from the context menu of the places sidebar. And Dolphin will also hide temporary and backup files, unless you actively choose to display them. Unfortunately, there's still no exact release schedule, but the likeliest estimate seems to be the middle of November, although that date is not official. And all of this cool stuff really makes me want to switch to KDE again. I cannot wait to get my hands on Plasma 6. Now the first beta for Linux Mint 21.2 is now out in its Cinnamon, XFC and Mate variants as usual. Mint Debian edition will as always follow in a bit. It's generally not released at the same time as the main Mint editions. The feature list is pretty long with a better login screen that now supports multiple keyboard layouts plus tap to click on touchpads and a configurable layout for the on-screen keyboard. Mint's software manager app now includes flat packs in the recommended apps and it got a UI refresh with a header bar and a more legible scoring system. The Pix image viewer was rebased on a newer version of Gthumb with better performance, more file formats being supported, better zoom controls, bigger thumbnail options, a color picker and a lot more. In the visual department, the folder icons now use your accent color instead of a colored stripe. Tooltips and notifications now use that accent color as well. Title bar buttons are better aligned and symbolic icons in the menus are now more legible. Mint also now has styles which let you change the theme of the desktop faster with accent color support and you still get access to full theme customization if you prefer. Mint also supports desktop portals to support dark mode as a global setting. Gestures were added for touchscreens and touchpads and tablets and they can be configured in the settings and there are a lot of smaller improvements all around. I've been using Mint 21.2 since the beta was released and I have a bunch of thoughts about it which I'll publish in a video next week. Of course, there's also stuff happening for GNOME. This week with the text editor now using LibAdvita's toolbar view component to be more adaptive. The calendar app now also uses LibAdvita widgets in the edit calendar page and in the main app itself in its dialogues so it should look more coherent with other GNOME apps and it should fit properly on mobile devices as well. GNOME Web now uses the Advita tab overview and some new LibAdvita widgets as well and it looks pretty damn good these days. Gnome Discs, one of the last core Gnome apps to not have moved to GTK4, is looking for help to complete the port and the UI refresh. And Gnome Workbench, the sandbox app to play around with Gnome and LibAdvita components, now supports way more elements you can test and build. List, the to-do list app has a new release with animations, settings for backing up your data, and some UI improvements. Tube Converter got some user documentation in a new help menu, and it will automatically select your downloads folder as the default if you didn't set one yourself. Fosh, the mobile shell using GNOME technologies, can now run on the Pine tab too. iPlan, which is another to-do list and project management app, now has a new project create window. It lets you drop tasks on each other to turn them into subtasks, and it has some UI improvements as well. Denaro, the personal finance manager, can now import existing data when setting up a new account, and there's a new GNOME extension called Peak Top Bar on Full Screen, which, as its name implies, lets you show the top bar by placing your mouse on the top edge of the screen when something is running full screen. And as always, it's really cool to see those GNOME apps finishing their porting work to LibAdvita and generally getting more adaptive and responsive, so we're getting closer and closer to a full suite of apps for Linux smartphones. Now, in order to make open source software work better together, Thunderbird has asked their community to give them a few ideas on how to better integrate their email client with LibreOffice 
to build some sort of well-integrated productivity suite on Linux. The top five ideas are to integrate a Thunderbird launcher icon in the LibreOffice dashboard, to let users link documents to calendar events or tasks, to have the ability to create calendar events and tasks straight from LibreOffice, plus a simpler workflow to export a document to PDF and send it via email with Thunderbird straight from LibreOffice. They also want to unify the keyboard shortcuts to style text, and they want to add the ability to insert a Thunderbird contact into a LibreOffice document by simply mentioning that. Now, Thunderbird set up a meta issue to track these changes and these integrations, and now we just have to wait for these cool features to be picked up by people who are interested in them, either from the Thunderbird or the LibreOffice dev community, or from entirely new contributors. Of course, for now, these are just ideas on a page, but both projects have expressed their interest in working together to form a well-integrated productivity suite on Linux, which is really, really cool. Okay, and let's finish this with the gaming news. If you're a fan of old-school Diablo, you might enjoy Devolution X, a way to run Diablo 1 and its Hellfire extension on current systems. It's an open-source engine that lets you play these games. It just got a new release with floating damage numbers, an option to auto-pick up oils, quest item drops being based on the game's difficulty, making all quests available in multiplayer, giving access to PvP arenas, and some upgraded graphics and lighting. Of course, the engine also already supported gamepads, multiplayer, high FPS, custom resolutions, or custom aspect ratios. And it looks like a cool way to play the original Diablo, much like Open Morrowind is a better way to play Morrowind than just using the native engine. And the long list of emulation-related tools on Steam Deck gets even bigger with Retro Deck, which got a new beta, version 0.7.0b for beta. They now have a new controller layout to unify hotkeys for all emulators. Modding is made easier with a new folder layout. It integrates with Emulation Station to get an easy UI. It ships with the latest RetroArch emulation cores and the latest standalone emulators. It also adds Wii U support from CMU and experimental support for multiple users. And it looks like a pretty simple and cool way to set up your emulation station on your Steam Deck or any other SteamOS or Holo ISO device. And speaking of devices, how about I tell you about our sponsor? Tuxedo. They make laptops and desktops that run with Linux out of the box. And this is important because it means that the hardware is totally Linux compatible. Contrary to something you might buy with Windows slapped on it, where you can't be 100% sure that everything inside this laptop will be correctly supported and will run well. Tuxedo has a long list of devices from the smallest ultrabooks to the biggest gaming towers or workstations, gaming laptops, all form factors, all sizes, they have everything and all devices are super configurable, all the laptops are openable, repairable and upgradable and you can even have your own custom logo or keyboard layout engraved on the keys or on the lid of your laptop. So if you need a new computer and you plan to run Linux on it, stop buying devices that only support Windows officially, buy something that supports Linux. You can just click the link in the description to browse their devices. So, thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, or to write a comment. And if you didn't like the video, well, you can always click that thumbs down button and tell me why in the comments as well. And if you really love these kinds of videos and you want to support the channel, there are plenty of links in the description for LibraPay, PayPal, Patreon, Basically anything, you know how this works. So, thanks for watching, and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!